I do think it is fairly obvious that Martha deserves a medal for putting up with me for 21 years now. Um, you know, it turns out they don't sell medals for those kinds of things, but she should get one. Uh, so uh, uh, moving into the sermon, I want to ask a question to you all. Have, have you all ever noticed that our world is really filled with rhythms? I mean, rhythm is, is everywhere when you stop and look at it, right? There's a rhythm to our heartbeat. Uh, there's a rhythm to our breathing. Uh, even, let's say you're watching a basketball game, right? There's just a rhythm. When a really good player gets into this rhythm, there's a rhythm to how they catch the ball and shoot. In fact, rhythms are everywhere. They're so prevalent in our world, most of the time we don't even stop and think about it. In fact, we usually only stop and think about those when the rhythms are off for some reason. Like when you wake up in the middle of the night and your heartbeat is racing or it's irregular, that's when you think about that rhythm. Or when you're struggling to get your next breath or when your favorite player can't make a shot. That's when you remember the importance of rhythm. And the Bible teaches us that we are designed to live in rhythm with God. Right, so in our last sermon series, we talked about how in Jesus, God was doing something new. He was bringing the kingdom of God into the world. That in the life of Jesus, uh, God's will and his power came into the world in a new way. And for those of us who follow Jesus today, that the call on our life is very simple. We are called to embody the kingdom to lean into the power of the Holy Spirit and let God's power help us actually live out the kingdom, live out its values in what we do each and every day. And it turns out that there are certain habits, certain practices, certain activities that we can engage in that help us stay connected to the power of God, that help us stay in rhythm with God. So for the next month, what we're going to be doing in our sermon series is we're just going to be looking at some of those practices that can help us stay connected to God. So we're calling the series Rhythms because it's all about the rhythm you fall into. But we also subtitled it Spiritual Practices for Normal People. And the goal is really practical, right? We want to talk about what some of these practices are, and describe the ways that they do help us stay connected to the power of God, to abide in him, as it says in John 15. And then from there, we just want to give you some simple suggestions that you can think about to incorporate these practices into your life and make them more and more a part of your daily and weekly rhythm. Because we believe that as these things become part of the normal rhythm of our life, we do stay better connected to the power of God. And we wanted to call it this idea about spiritual practices for normal people. Because we really do want to emphasize that these are things that all of us can do. I mean, it's not like you have to work at a church or be like a spiritual giant. Like that gives you this inside track into the kinds of things you can do to stay connected to God. No, the kind of things that we're going to talk about are things that all of us can do. But that really can lead to the life that God has for us. So this morning, we want to start out this idea by, by talking about the topic of prayer and how that can help us stay in rhythm with God. So to do that, I'd love to invite you to turn with me in the Bible to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, if it would help you for any reason, there's some red Bibles in the seats around you. You can grab one of those and turn to the page number that's there on the screen. Um, but as you turn there, I want to share this really interesting statistic with you I came across. So a recent survey said that 90% of Americans report that they have prayed in the last few days. Because So you think about it, think about every person that you know. Just chances are good that nine out of the ten of them, at some point in the last few days, they've at least shot one little prayer up there. But the other interesting part of that is that same survey found that only 80% of Americans believe that God exists, right? So if you, if you do the math, that means that there's 10% of the people out there who aren't convinced that God is real, but they're still willing to give prayer a shot every once in a while because you just don't ever know and you may want to cover your bases. But now for some of us who are in that 90%, the people who've prayed recently, Prayer is, it's a meaningful part of our daily life, right? It is just an integral part about how we live and how we stay connected to God. But for others, right, if you're new to the church or maybe you're exploring faith for yourself, that prayer may be something that you really just keep in your back pocket, uh, you know, for the, the occasional sort of get out of jail free card when you need it. So if you're new to the church or to the teachings of Jesus, my hope today is that we can talk about prayer in a way that, that helps you understand the role it can play in your life. And you might start giving prayer a try more than the occasional like, oh God, if you'll really help me out, you know, I'll owe you one kind of prayers. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, uh, just my hope is that we can really have a deeper appreciation for prayer and think about ways that we can continue to go further up and further in in prayer in our lives. So to do this, I want to just start out with a really simple definition of what prayer is. So at its core, I think prayer is just simply conversation with God. It's setting aside time to intentionally connect with him and communicate with him. It's sharing our thoughts and our needs. It's expressing what is going on. It's expressing our love for him and our, our worship of him. It's listening to how he wants to speak back to us, how he wants to lead us and speak to us and guide us. 
And one of the interesting things about it, right, is if you look at the life of Jesus, as it's recorded in the biographies that we have in the New Testament, it's just really clear that prayer was a regular part of the normal rhythm of his life. So a couple examples for that. Mark tells us that very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Luke, Luke talks about Jesus' prayer life a lot. At one point he says that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. In another part of Luke's biography, like the day before Jesus has to make this really vital decision, uh, Luke says that he goes up onto a mountainside to pray and he spends the night praying to God. And later, as Jesus is teaching his disciples, it says Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them what? That they should always pray and not give up. Right? Jesus' life was marked by this, this rhythm of communication and conversation and connection with God through prayer. And he did that because he knew he had to stay connected to the power of the Holy Spirit if he was going to live the life that he was called to live. And here's something to stop and think about it. If Jesus knew that he needed prayer to live the life he was called to live, how much more do we need to stay connected to God in prayer if we're going to live the life that we're called to live? I mean, he was Jesus after all, and the last time I checked, we're not. But Jesus knew this, right? He knew that those of us who follow him would need to lean into God's presence through prayer which is why he talked about prayer, and which is why he taught his disciples about prayer. And in the passage that I had to turn to in Matthew 6, this is one of those moments where Jesus is teaching about prayer. So starting in verse 5, let's read that together. It says this, And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen, then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, don't, don't keep on babbling like the pagans, because they think they're going to be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them. So this passage, these verses, are a real small part of what has to be the most well-known religious and ethical teaching that has ever been given. Right? We know it as, as part of a sermon Jesus gave called the Sermon on the Mount. Um, But in this passage, he he lays out, in the Sermon on the Mount, he lays out sort of a blueprint for the Christian life and what it looks like to faithfully follow Jesus in the world. And there's so many things that we could pull out of that, but there's just three really short lessons I want to pull out from this passage that talks about prayer. And the very first one of those is found in one of the first words that Jesus says. If you notice, when he starts talking about it, he says, and when you pray. Like, he doesn't say, and if you pray. Like, you know, if you guys happen to find the time, if you happen to get around to it. No, his assumption is that we are already doing it. I mean, like I said earlier, Jesus knew that that staying connected to God through prayer was just a vital part about how he was going to actually be able to live the life he was created to live. So he doesn't spend a lot of time in this passage trying to convince his followers that they should do it or say, hey, let me tell you the benefits of prayer. No, he just assumes like if he's got to do it, they know that they're going to need to do it as well. So he just says, hey, when you pray, Right? It's just this expectation that those who followed Jesus back then would be connected in this regular rhythm of praying to God. And if it was true for them back then, it is just as true for us today. When it comes to prayer, we need to be when prayers. We don't need to be if prayers, the if we get around to it prayers. Uh, but the second thing I want to draw your attention to is found in verse 6. So verse 6 says this. It says, But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Okay, so this doesn't mean that we all have to remodel our homes so that we have like a physical closet that we can go into and close the door, and that's the only place that we can pray. Again, think about how it fits into the larger argument Jesus is making. He's just been talking about the hypocrites who go out in public, and you know, they're praying on the street corners because they want everybody to see them and see how holy they are and think, wow, that guy, boy, he's really praying. He must be pretty close to God. He's saying, no, 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 when it comes to prayer, it's not about what you get from other people, you know, like the the, uh, admiration you get from other people. And it's definitely not about other people seeing you. And it's not even about just asking God for things, like he's this cosmic vending machine in the sky that, you know, if we say the right things, he owes us something. Instead, he gives us this image of saying, when you pray, go somewhere private. Because what he wants to connect with us is when we pray, it's really not about what other people see or what other people think. Prayer at its heart is about connection with God. It's not about a transaction, about getting something from God or or getting something in the eyes of other people as they see us do it. That's what he's getting at when he's talking about going into this room and doing it in private. It's about finding a rhythm where you can connect with God for the sake of relationship, not for the sake of being seen by other people. 
Right? What Jesus is driving at is that when it comes with prayer, the goal is connection. It is not transaction. And if you're married, right, you, you know how this works. You can think about an example. Um, so Martha and I's marriage is perfect now, but there's a time when it wasn't. <laughs> now, I mean, after 21 years of marriage, right, so we have figured a few things out. So we've got four kids, right, ages 14 and under. So right now, it's the middle of basketball season, and we've got gymnastics, and there's art lessons. So like, our, our life is just pretty full between the things the kids are doing and school and work. Like, it, it's just the calendar's kind of complicated. So at least once a week, Martha and I have to sit down with each other and kind of figure out the logistics for the week, the blocking and tackling. Okay, well, if you could pick Simon up at practice this day, I can be over here and get to campus for the gymnastics thing. Like, there's just a lot going on, so we have to communicate about that. But here's the thing. What do you think our relationship would be like if those were the only conversations that we ever had? Right? If the only times that we spoke to each other were conversations about what I need from you or what I need you to do to help me out to make this work. There's not a lot of connection there. So you can imagine a scenario where a couple of months go by, and those are the only conversations that Martha and I ever have, just the, the, the who's doing what, when, and where conversations. And then all of a sudden, there's a night when you know, the kids go to bed early or something, and we're sitting there on the couch, and we realize that we are two feet apart from each other, but we are completely disconnected. Like we have no idea what is going on in each other's lives. Right? You can talk business all day and never connect at a level that really matters. And what is true for marriage is true for our relationship with God, right? God wants us to have a relationship with him, an ongoing conversation with him that goes beyond that, God, here's my list of what I need from you today. Again, what God really wants is this sense of connection, to connect with us at the heart level, to hear what's going on. He wants us to share with him what we're thinking and feeling, and he wants us to develop the skill of listening as he speaks into those things. And he does all of that because he cares for us. Right, so when it comes to prayer, right, we need to, to prayer, we need to think about prayer in terms of when we do it, not in terms of if we do it. And we need to remember that prayer at its heart is about connection. It is not about transaction. But the last little point I want to make, uh, it, it actually has to do with the actual words that we use. So Jesus talks about that. Look at what he says in verses 7 or 8. He says, and when you pray, don't keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them. So again, what's Jesus getting at here? I, I think the idea he's driving at is that when it comes to prayer, what really matters is the content of the prayer, right? Not the form that the prayer takes. It, sometimes when people, especially if you're new to prayer, like you can get this idea that like there's a magic formula for prayer. Like, you know, if you don't pray using these and thous in King James English, that like God doesn't understand what you're saying. Or some people say, well, the Bible says, you know, we need to pray in the name of Jesus. So if you don't actually say in the name of Jesus at the end of your prayer, like it, it hits the ceiling and bounces back down. That's what he's getting at. He says, don't be like the pagans, right? There was a lot of thought in these other religions that there was this sort of litany of things you had to say. There was a certain way that you had to speak, things that you had to say. Otherwise, your prayer didn't count. Otherwise, the gods wouldn't cure you and wouldn't respond. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Don't make prayer more complicated than it needs to be. When it comes to prayer, what you say matters so much more than how you say it, right? So just speak to God, right? Prayer doesn't have to be any more complicated than it is to speak to a friend or speak to someone that you're close to. Now, one clarification, I think it's important to make that what Jesus is saying here is not like a, a prohibition saying you can never use a written prayer. And you can never repeat things in prayer. Because it's interesting, if you read back to the Sermon on the Mount, you know what the very next thing is that Jesus says after he tells this, this teaching to his disciples? He gives them the Lord's Prayer, right? He teaches them how to pray this Lord's Prayer, which is a written prayer that many people repeat every single day. And I've just found that oftentimes written prayers can be incredibly helpful as starting points. Because they remind us of the big things we need to talk to God about. They're a framework to start with. And oftentimes as we pray them, we're reminded of things that are going on in our heart. And we add to that framework just the thoughts and the concerns of whatever we may be going through in the moment. Now, I mentioned at the top that one of the goals in this series is to share some real practical thoughts and ideas about how to develop these practices in our lives. And to help us do that, I've invited Claudia Lee to come and share some of the ways that she prays in her life. Uh, many of you know that Claudia's husband, Steve, was the, the pastor here before I came to Suburban for 31 years. And I, oh my gosh, I appreciate so many things about Steve and Claudia. Uh, but one of the things that I really do appreciate them about them a lot is, is about the way that Claudia prays. So when I thought, okay, who can really help us get some practical uh, ideas on how to work prayer into our lives in a more meaningful way? Uh, Claudia is the very first name that I thought of. And luckily, she was gracious enough not to say no. So Claudia, if you want to come and share with us, we're excited to learn from you. 
Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. So um, I love the definition of prayer that Pastor Mike shared earlier. Prayer is simply conversation with God. And really, in many ways, that's all we need to know. But as in any relationship, sometimes tools and reminders and different ways to communicate can be helpful to keep the conversation alive and growing. Like many of you, I've engaged in a lifelong struggle and desire to grow in prayer, to grow in my intimate relationship with the Lord. And I just want to say thank you for allowing me to share with you a few simple ways that have helped me move toward a deeper and more consistent prayer life. And I pray that something that I share today will be an encouragement to your prayer life as well. One of the practices that have been helpful in my prayer life is to write down my prayers. I keep a prayer journal. For me, there is something about holding a pen to paper that anchors my thoughts and keeps me present with the Lord and with the prayer I'm lifting. I like to start my prayer time with a gratitude recap of the day before, just thanking God for the events of the day and acknowledging answers to prayer and the other ways I've seen God at work. Generally, I shift into some time in scripture after that and then go into writing out the rest of the prayers I'm bringing. And the, the scripture time often informs the way I pray from that point on. I like this practice because I can go back to what I've prayed for and very clearly see the answers God has given. And perhaps you aren't a pen and paper person because not all of us are. Technology can be a great help too. Just last week, I stumbled upon an app that's new to me called Echo Prayer. Echo Prayer allows you to create prayers and schedule reminders for yourself to pray daily, weekly, monthly, you know, whatever you choose. It also has functions that allow you to share the prayer, to tell someone you've prayed for them, and to create prayer groups. I so appreciate reminders to pray, and God does provide those to me throughout my day, even without an app, but I'm guessing he likes technology too, and probably honestly more than Randy does. <laughs> so in line with the idea of prayer reminders, I've come to enjoy what is sometimes called fixed time prayers. This idea comes from the ancient church and even before the Church of Jesus Christ existed. In Jewish religious practice, the observant individual was called to pray three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening. And that's a practice Jews continue to this day. As Pastor Mike mentioned, Jesus was in regular communication with the Father, and we see that all through the Gospels. And as an observant Jew, one of the ways he would have maintained that communication was by practicing the three daily prayer times, by practicing fixed time prayer. In my life, those fixed prayer times have become a sweet reminder, focusing me on the reality of God and his kingdom and this relationship I love and cherish so much. In a real way, fixed prayer helps me to pray continually as Paul encourages us to do in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Fixed time prayer can be as simple as setting mental reminders to pray upon rising, to pray at lunch, to pray after you've gotten into bed, or whatever works for you. And then the prayer itself can be simple, too. For a season, I prayed the Lord's Prayer at each designated time. And when the Lord's Prayer is prayed mindfully, it's the most eloquent, complete, worshipful prayer we have in our prayer lexicon. Recently, I've been using another app for my fixed time prayer. The app is called Daily Prayer. It includes up to four fixed times of prayer a day, and I'm using three of those times. In the settings app, you can, in the settings of the app, you can choose which of the four times you want to utilize, and you can set the reminders to the times that work best for you in your day. The app opens to a beautiful welcome page appropriate to the time of day. From that open page, you're taken to an opening prayer, a time of confession, a selection of scriptures, and then the Lord's Prayer as a closing prayer. And throughout the day, at the different times of day, that selection of items that come to you will be slightly different. I found I don't always utilize all of the options. Um, generally, I don't use the scripture because I'm in another scripture program, but I really, really enjoy the guided prayer. The prayer app draws from the Book of Common Prayer, and one of the things that most encourages me is that hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of other believers are praying the same prayers I'm praying. I, I love that. So many of you know that my husband Steve and I have a daughter, Becky, in heaven, and my prayer life was radically changed after Becky died. 
One of the things that changed the most is my understanding of praying for others and of being prayed for by others. In the first nine months following Becky's death, our son-in-law and our two granddaughters were still living in Rosalia, Washington, just outside of Spokane. About once a month, I would make the nearly nine-hour drive through the Columbia River Gorge to Rosalia to spend a week with them, helping them with daily life and the processing of an incredible grief. This was hard, but it was so, so good. You can imagine all of the challenges inherent in this endeavor. I was leaving Steve alone in his fresh grief for a week at a time. I was dealing with my own grief. At that time, I hated the Winter Gorge Drive, and I, I really kind of love it now. I was longing to help these three people I love so much navigate life without wife and mother and to survive and to embrace their own grief. So much hard. God raised up a small but powerful army of women who loved me and prayed for me. These women cleared very full calendars and came to my house right before each of the trips I made to Rosalia. They let me tell them all the things I was concerned about, my grief, my fears, my inadequacies, and then they let me sit in a chair and cry. They laid their hands on me and prayed beautiful, anointed prayers over me. It felt to me like sitting at the very feet of God. Each one prayed in a way unique to them. One prayed prayers full of mercy and grace and compassion. One prayed prayers brimful of scripture and the promises of God. Another prayed warrior prayers girding me for what was to come. And another prayed the most practical prayers you can imagine. God answered those prayers in so many profound ways. And God changed my own heart about praying for others. I love to pray for others now because I know in the deepest, deepest part of me that prayer makes a difference. So some hints about praying for others. When someone asks you to pray for them, if at all possible, ask if you can pray out loud for them that, at that very moment, whether it's in person, on the phone, uh, FaceTime, whatever. Don't worry about the words you pray for them. Eloquence isn't required. Holy words aren't required. Just pray your heart for them. Romans 8.26 assures us, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes. The Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. If praying out loud isn't possible, go ahead and word a prayer in your heart. Even if you have no words, only tears, your heart on behalf of that person directed toward God is a prayer in itself as Holy Spirit intercedes along with you. Another way to pray for each other that's been a blessing to me is prayer texting. Um, and we had this happen just last night. I'm prayer of, uh, a part of a couple of prayer texting groups. We send prayer requests out to the group and know that the people in the group will pray when they see the text. Often we type our prayers and scriptures back to each other, and it's such, such an encouragement to actually see those prayers and promises written out and to be able to go back to them and back to them. It's, it's a gift. So there's so much I haven't talked about. Praying the Psalms, breath prayers, praying prayers of lament, praying scripture, the prayer of rel relinquishment, prayers of confession and repentance, prayer and fasting, and on and on and on. Find the tools and techniques that help you not all that I've talked about today will work in your prayer life. For those of you who are interested in digging a bit deeper into some of the ideas I've shared or who want to download the prayer apps, there are links to additional information that will come to your email inbox this week. So watch for Suburban's e-newsletter for those links. And now, may God bless you with a hunger and desire for more of him and a deeper prayer life that helps satisfy that desire. Amen. Well, thank you, Claudia. Like I said, there are so many things uh, that we appreciate about Steve and Claudia, and Martha and I love it when, when we have an opportunity to get together with them and just share what's going on in our lives and hear what's going on in their lives, and we pray for them. And then when they pray for us and as we're leaving, when Claudia's like, I will be praying for you, I'm just like, yes, <laughs> Claudia Lee's praying for me. Like, it's all going to work out. Um, no, but it, it's just one of those things, and I love, I love the encouragement that she gave to be praying for each other. Uh, to ask for prayer when you need it and, and to pray for others when needs come into our mind because when we do that, when we pray for each other, we are embodying the kingdom. 
we are living the life together that, that God has for us. And you know, when Cass was talking about small groups and these cards, these information cards, that's one of the reasons that we do this. Because if you don't have other people who can pray for you and you don't know where to start in a church this size, this is a great way to do that to just get some more information, to start to, to make a big church feel a little bit more like home so you can meet the people who can be praying for you and, and who you can be praying for. And again, to help you, as you go, there's some tables in the back with these little post-it notes that say pray first on the bottom of these. That's an idea we talk about up here at the church a lot. Again, I would encourage you to take one of these and put some of your prayer requests on it and just stick this sucker in some place that you'll see it. You know, your bathroom mirror in the morning or the dashboard of your car. Because we all need those reminders to be praying regularly. So I, I want to go back to where we started with the, with the title of the series, right? So we said this is called Rhythms. It's Spiritual Practices for Normal People. Um, but at this point, you might be thinking, okay, so far I've heard a pastor talk about prayer. And then I heard a pastor's wife talk about prayer who's retired, who's got enough time to pray like four times a day and do all these other kind of things. Like, wh when are we going to hear from the normal people, right? I, I see how prayer could be a part in your life, but then how does this work in my life? How does this work in my nine to five? How does this work as I'm approaching retirement and trying to figure out what God has next for me? Well, to get a picture of that, I'd like to invite Terry Lambright to come forward. Uh, and Terry's just going to take a few moments, and he's going to share a little bit about how prayer has been uh, a key thing in his life lately and how he's seen God show up and respond to his prayers. So with that introduction, I'm Mr. Normal, although uh, <laughs> my wife might disagree with that. but. <laughs> Uh, so my story begins when last spring, when I uh, went to a missions council meeting, missions committee meeting, to hear about the missions trips that had occurred in 2018. So these were trips to Uganda and to India. Um, so I went, after going to that, I was really inspired by that, but it really felt like God was calling me to stretch myself and volunteer to go on one of these trips myself. So it happens that I'm an engineer by my education and stuff. and. Uh, I was getting close to retirement, trying to figure out what to do, uh, how to use those skills. And in the early summer, I was talking to Brian Paul, one of our elders here. Oh, I see you right there. Hey, Brian. <laughs> um, about appropriate technology. That, that means using technology that is available in the culture that you're in. So, you know, it's not probably iPads, but it, it's a, a lower level of technology that can be useful for daily life. So Brian had been talking to our supported missionaries, Val and Waffle, Waffle Lomilo, um, about a need for a human-powered rock crusher. So in Uganda, when they build, when they make concrete for building purposes, you need to have gravel, you know, small gravel. And they currently do that by hand, believe it or not. They use big sledgehammers and big guys to, to break the big rocks into smaller pieces, and they have a bunch of smaller kids with smaller hammers beat those into little teeny pieces of gravel. So you can imagine, this takes a long time, and they don't get very much for the, all of their labor. So uh, Brian had, you know, he's, he's a professor at OSU. He knows about, uh, he's kind of in charge of some senior engineering projects. So he said, hey, you could possibly be a mentor to one of these teams that are going to be developing a, a human-powered rock crusher. I said, that would be great. I'd, I'd love to do that. So uh, that's kind of the background to set all this up. And now I'll uh, get into the power of prayer in the midst of this. So little did I know how complicated my life would become uh, during the fall. You know, so I learned about this in the spring and the summer and, uh, and in the fall. Uh, many of you may know that my, my daughter-in-law, Dan Danielle, has been fighting cancer for many years. And uh, unfortunately, I now share grief with the Lees about losing a, a family member to cancer. So in October, Beth and I decided that we needed to go over to Missoula to spend some time caring for their needs. And we didn't know how long this would be. We just knew it would be a long time. So uh, I was trying to balance, okay, I've, I've got this obligation. I want to go on this missions trip. I've got to, to meet with the missions team. I've got to um, balance meeting with the students to help, help them with their design. Uh, so that <clears throat> obviously forced me to my knees a lot. Lord, help me to, to balance all of, all of these things. And I don't, so I, this is kind of an answer to the prayer. I said, Lord, draw me closer to you this year. Well, that, that did it. <laughs> I was drawn closer to him. So as I was uh, you know, deepening my trust in him, I was reminded of, of Proverbs 16, 9, where it says, a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And that just so, for me, that's kind of an essence of prayer for me. I, I've got my plans. I, I want to do certain things. And as I go through the day, something disrupts those plans. And I say, okay, Lord, this is, this is your, 
your directing of my steps. So I, I yield to that. So unfortunately, Danielle's health continued to decline, and, but we didn't know how long she'd continue to live. But she was really a fighter. She, uh, at one point, I was talking to her about going to Uganda. She just asked me what I was doing over there. And, and, but I was concerned about leaving and you know, my, my support for my son and, and for her and for Beth. Um, so she, she told me, being this fighter that she is, she said, well, you go ahead and go to Uganda, and then next year I'll go with you. <laughs> so she was, she was just so convinced she, she was going to recover from this and, uh, and be able to, to maybe do something for God as well. So reluctantly, I, I returned to Corvallis last, uh, early December and uh, trying to get my last series of vaccinations and get things ready for the trip. But I was only home for a couple of weeks before Beth called and said that things were really turning badly. So here's the thought process I went through. I said, Lord, should I drive back to Missoula uh, to be with the family in, in the midst of all this? Uh, should I stay in Corvallis and then maybe even have to leave for Uganda without knowing the resolution of this? Or should I just cancel the Uganda trip altogether? Um, I didn't know what to do. I was really kind of stuck. Turns out that Danielle passed away a couple of days after that, uh, that big um, spike or down, downhill turn. So I decided I had just enough time to drive over on Christmas Eve uh, to spend Christmas Day with Beth and, and our son Chris. And then uh, we spent a few more days with him to kind of take care of some of the details surrounding the death and then drive back home. And, and that gave me one day to get ready for, for Uganda, the final, the final preparation. But the family members were okay with this and said, yes, go ahead, this is the right thing to do. Go ahead and do that. So, so I did. Uh, one last answer to prayer is kind of about the small little things that God does, the, the way he blesses us in, in little ways that we don't expect. So you can imagine traveling to Entebbe, Uganda is a long process. It's about 24 hours with all the layovers and everything. So you get very little sleep, you're kind of groggy. So get, uh, you know, we arrive in Entebbe, I'm getting off the plane and I'm gathering up all, up all my belongings and I laid my glasses, my, my first pair of prescription glasses, which I now have contacts in, that's why I can read. <laughs> But uh, my prescription glasses, which I, I were, never spent money on before, I decided, oh, I'm going to put them in the seat in front of me where Brian was sitting. You know, he had stand, stood up at this point, so, and then I'll grab him when I get on the way out. Well, uh, just groggy, like I said, I left the plane, leaving the glasses on the plane. Um, so unbeknownst to me, you know, I got kind of fed up waiting for everybody to get off the plane, so I went downstairs to the airport. Everybody else is standing upstairs. And it turns out one of our team members brought my glasses to Brian and handed it to him and says, hey, Brian, I found your glasses. I said, I don't have any glasses. They're not my glasses. So, so they went back onto the airplane. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know this was happening. You know, I didn't even miss, <laughs> being so groggy, I didn't even miss my glasses until till the, till the next day. And I go, hey, where's my glasses? And, and then Brian, who's sharing a tent with me, says, hey, I, I kind of remember some glasses being discussed, but I didn't know who they were. <laughs> So I wanted to smack him, but I didn't. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I thought, okay, Lord, if this is a lesson you want to teach me just about being more careful and more mindful, and okay, but I really don't want to lose these glasses. So I passed this message on to Beth. I was able to connect briefly uh, by phone, and she sent out a prayer message. So a lot of people were praying. And two and a half weeks later, when I returned to that airport, um, I, as I was checking in, right next to me was a customer service agent, and I mentioned... Hey, I, you probably don't have this, but you know, I'm looking for some glasses. It's in a gray case. So, oh, you mean the hard gray case with two pairs of glasses? Yes, that's the one. So, oh, it's right here. You know, and he hands it to me. And oh, I should have brought the glasses case with me to prove to you that it was real. But, but God really cares about the little things, you know. And He provided those glasses to me. I, I have them now. I can use them when I don't have my contacts. And uh, so, this thanks for letting me share with you. Well, thank you, Terry, for being willing to share your story with us. Um, I actually remember when that prayer request came in, and I'm like, all right, God, I'll give it a shot. But, you know, African airport, three-week trip, like, uh, I'm not holding my breath on this one. Um, oh, me of little faith. Uh, no, but it, I, I so appreciate Terry sharing that story because it really just does go to show. Like, when it comes to prayer, God wants to be involved in all these things, these big-picture things like, God, I'm retiring. What do I do with all I've experienced in life to serve you? He can answer that. You think about these moments of just incredible personal grief and, and struggle. God, would you give me the strength I need to care for my family in this season? And he answers that prayer. 
And then just things like the glasses, right? It, those times how when things are, you're in this hard season in life and, and something happens, you're like, God, I know you've got other, you've got bigger fish to fry, but if you could help me find my glasses, it would just be such a wonderful demonstration of the fact that you are still here with me in the midst of this really hard time. And God just always surprises us with these little ways of reminding us that, yes, he's here and he listens. And that's why prayer is so important, right? It's why we've got to be when, not if prayers. And, and remember, it's about connection and not transaction and, and really focus on, on the content of the prayer. Because I think as we do that, as, as we put into practice some of these things that Claudia has suggested, as the Holy Spirit moves in that, I trust that we will have more and more of the very same kinds of experiences that Terry had, of seeing God show up in unexpected ways. To close out our...